So, um, before I was going to talk about it, I, in another lifetime, I was a newspaper reporter and some broadcast journalism. And as such, we get to decide what stories you want to cover. And so it changed a little bit. Okay, so we changed tactics a little bit. Um, if you are going down to Salem for the rally, or if you are doing something in your hometown for the rally, you're going to be sending out a press release. And you want that press release looked at. That's your first goal. You want a reporter to see your press release, because especially in the Portland area, probably in some other busy areas, a hundred things are going on. How are you going to get yours looked at? So, a couple of pointers. Make it match something that's happening either locally or in the state or nationally. So if you're in Eugene and you're planning a local rally in Eugene that's going to match, match something in Salem, mention there is like going to be a gazillion people in Salem coming, and this is your <coughs> local rally. If you're going to Salem for the rally, mention how many people are going to be there, how many people from Eugene are going to be there, and maybe so there's some people from Eugene with personal stories which will go to the local media. So make your press release personal, make it relevant to what's going on in the community and around the state. Because that way they'll grab it. The TV stations always want to localize, or they like to localize national news. So if you can pick up on something that's happening nationally in healthcare, if you're going to be doing something for the rally, what's happening nationally? What's been in the news? The 10% raise that um, a lot of the insurers are now doing, 8 to 10% because they are saying their costs are going up, tie that in. So that's the first tip, is tie in to your press release what's going on nationally to what's going on locally. Use a personal story. Put the personal story of very short synopsis on your press release because that will catch a reporter. The other thing is do not be afraid to call the reporters. Call two days before and call the day before and call in the morning. And you may think it's bugging them, but I know for me, when I was working, I, w I was at a, daily, at a twice, a two or three times a week newspaper. We were expected to do eight to ten stories a week. And I had people calling all the time. And if someone called, they were in my face, that would be easier. Nicely, politely in my face. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, keep on, email your press release in. Your press release, don't put a hundred statistics in there. Just put the statistics in there that relate to your community. How many people in your community don't have health care? How many people in your community um, have been neg neg negatively impacted by the ACA or paying more for insurance now than they did before or can't afford to pay the subsidy they now have to pay? So those are some things to get the media in. The part that I was going to be talking about was you're coming out of your legislator's office and all of a sudden a microphone's in your face because Media does not just follow the script. Okay, I'm handing you a press packet, the press table, go speak to this person and this person. But as a media person, I know that I didn't do that. I did that just to get background. But I wanted someone standing there with a sign, with a nice big sign, and I was gonna ask them a question. And if you're with your nice big sign, you're gonna get asked the question, as Jean was pointing out, be prepared to answer that question. And do that role playing. Oh, if you're coming out of your legislator's office, make some quick notes as you're writing out as the media is going to talk to you. What do they say? What would you like them to say? And what would you like the reporter to ask the legislator? Would you like the reporter to say, would it, be, it would be nice if you would also talk to the legislators and see what they're feeling. So those are just some pointers. Um, it's always good at the end, Jean was mentioning having your tough questions answered. Usually at the end, or sometimes at the end, the reporter is going to ask you anything else you want to add. That's a really good point to make sure you know those things that you didn't say, and that's hard, and add them. Um, stories, personal stories, are going to get on the air much more than anything else. If you have a really big personal story, it's going to get air, and the reporter is <coughs> going to want to speak to you even more. Any questions? That's real quick. Very, very, very good. Very good. And I was wondering, we have 10, ten minutes Q and A. So, Jean, do you want to? Right oh, yeah. Question and answer. We we can actually decide whether to do that because okay. uh, we've had questions during the session, and we actually are at the point where we would be after the Q and A session. Uh, so, if there's not objections, I think we should go ahead with. Uh, 
talking points. Diane? Can I ask a question for Lisa real quick? Because we're not going to, and I just didn't get a chance. Um, Lisa, uh, I just made a very naive question, which I don't doubt. But um, when you say we're going to put out a press release, are you indicating uh, every little organization from H HCAO is going to be putting out a press release, like in my case, if I'm going to, at our district, <coughs> let's say. So, so in Portland, then there might be 25, however many districts there are. Everybody's putting out press releases. Is that what, is that what we're talking about? No. Um, and I think that's maybe a Ross question. Is that, is that not on? This may be a Ross question or maybe a communications committee person, because there will be someone from your community doing that. Jim, do you want to answer that? Yeah, we'll have a general press release for statewide, and it'll also be set up so the press release can be customized for local groups, so that if you, as a local group, want to add some personal stories and some information and put out a press release locally, it'll be something you can do. And we have media teams for setting up around the state, so there'll be people involved in doing that in local areas. But it's not required that you write up your own press release We'll have a general press release, and then you can customize it for a local release as well. So, uh, we want to go ahead with um, key talking points uh, from our single payer um, campaign. And yeah, let's start. Tim, I think you're up first. First of all, let me say making a presentation, giving a speech, doing a PowerPoint, uh, that's an easy thing to do. The tough part is what comes after that. Whenever you conclude your presentation with uh, amen, they lived happily ever after, the end, whatever you do, uh, you're relinquishing control of the presentation at that point, and it becomes a shared experience between yourself and whomever else is there as your audience. So you need to be prepared for a transition in skill and ability. Uh, when you're making a presentation, uh, what you do is hopefully you have a well-reasoned, uh, well-crafted message that you're presenting. But when that message is presented, <coughs> you then need to be able to think on your feet to respond to other people's agendas. And that requires something of a different skill set. Uh, it's not that the two aren't related, but uh, you need to be able to uh, respond to someone else's lead as opposed to having the lead yourself. However, when we're fielding questions, you should be able to go back to, as Larry pointed out to us earlier, our primary message, better health care for more people at less cost. Or it's been suggested that we rephrase that, possibly saying good medical care for everybody at reasonable cost. At any rate, what we want to make sure is universality is a message, as Camillo has pointed out, and that we're looking for health care to be present for all who are concerned and need that health care. There are many off-ramps that can come our way, though, as people would hear what we have to say and try to respond to it. They will want to take us in the direction of a particular concern that is theirs, which is not necessarily where we need to go. Getting into the weeds with those kinds of things can confound and convolute and confuse the central message of what we're trying to say. So hopefully when we're asked a question, we can focus back in on the primary message that is ours. Good medical care for everybody at a reasonable cost. Sam Metz, uh, who we've quoted here several times before, likes to say, we might do well to pose a question to somebody if they have a concern for one of these uh, uh, various subject matters that could lead us astray, whether you're talking about uh, free market or government interference or reproductive rights or human rights. Uh, Sam would say, maybe you could ask that person who's raising those objections to universal single payer, if we had a health care system that costs significantly less than our current health care system does and provides better care for more people, would you care what that system included? Would that one thing stand in the way for that system to be provided for everyone? Now, we should also recognize that their fact, fact of the matter is will be some people that we will never convince for our cause, especially those people, uh, as Sin, Upton Sinclair said, 
whose salary depends upon their not understanding, they're not going to understand. So I don't know that you and I need to waste our time and energy trying to convert those people. But I'm firmly convinced that our primary message of good medical care for everybody at reasonable cost does address everybody's self-interest. It's like the uh, Civic Club I was talking to in Albany uh, several months back. They had just finished their meal where they meet on a weekly basis at a local restaurant. And so one of the people, having heard my presentation, asked one of the standard tough questions. Why should I care that everybody has health care coverage? Well, all I had to do was to tell him, I hope he just enjoyed his dinner. Because the chances are the person in the kitchen who prepared his dinner and the person who just served his dinner do not have health care coverage. So that whatever they have of a health care need that has not been tended to because they cannot afford it is now his to be concerned about. <laughs> or if it didn't happen with that meal, it may well happen at the next meal. That's why we should be concerned for universal coverage. So, I think that message gets to everyone's self-interest as we all live and move in the greater community uh, that we call home. Great. Thank you very much. Excellent. Our next, our next speaker will be Sandra. Come on up here, Sandra. All right. You're going to be talking about equity. Um, so, do you believe the health care is a human right? Yeah. 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 Do we? Oh, good. And what is equity for you? Everybody in? Anything that comes to your mind. <laughs> Everybody in? Nobody else? What else? Fairness. Fairness. People get what they need. People get what they need. And what else? Mean all differences in, in the world. Yes. Accessible to everyone. Sorry? Accessible to everyone. Accessible to everyone. What else? Everybody gets treated equally. Everybody gets treated, treated equally. Doesn't know any economic boundaries. <laughs> no economic boundaries. How about justice? Yes. Does it make sense? Yes. Something even uh, a little bit more than uh, fairness would be justice. Can we agree on this? So um, then I want also to talk about just two minutes um, immigrants and all undocumented. Who are undocumented in this country? Do you know? Who are undocumented well, in this country? Latinos for sure. Latinos for sure. Who else? Also be people that, that, oh, sorry. Sorry? It could also be some of the Africans that come from the African countries. Some Africans who came from African countries. Who else? Well, you, uh, usually people that, that pick all our wonderful produce and fruit yeah. and, and do jobs that most people don't want. Yes, so you were talking about... Uh, what population, what community that we could identify? Well, usually the people that pick our produce and, and fruit are Latinos. Ah, pick our produce, yes. Yeah, thank you. Who else? People, hey, who, people who live in counties where the courthouse burned down. Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. old, old people who were born places where there wasn't good documenting being done when they were born. <laughs> and Jim? Canadians. Canadians! Who else? Dairy workers. Dairy workers. There you workers. Who else? Well, soon there's going to be people from the Middle East coming in after what's going on over there. So, VAs, right? Yeah. Salah. Who else? Everybody. Children that were brought here when they were young. From Children that were brought here when they were young. And now we have the program that is DACA. We know, D-A-C-A. Okay, what I want to tell you, just one information. Did you know that all this... Uh, I'm going to talk now specifically about immigrants, not just Latinos, all immigrants, and that is immigrants and refugees, because refugees may still be in a process that they may, may not have their um, documentation yet, and they would have you know, some kind of a support, but not, not truly a good uh, health care. So when we're talking about equity, it's also come together universality. Does it make sense? Good. So um, one of the information uh, that may, you might not know, but among 25 million of immigrants, 
um, which is only 8% of the, 8, sorry, 8, okay, not 88, 8% of the population, 12 million are known undocumented. Uh, and then there is a study in 2005 that estimated that among this um, 25 million people, so all together, spend only $39 billion in health care annually, uh, less than 2% of our 2.6 trillion for the whole American population, for everybody who lives here. So this is one of the informations we have. So, and uh, another important information, uh, even though this, uh, um, we're not talking about what, what we have in spent in, uh, annually, even though it's a small amount, um, healthcare exceeds what undocumented immigrants pay in tax. Do you heard about these? People tell you about that? So, really this information, um, that uh, an article that we can find about health affairs in Medicare receives $16 billion more in taxes from undocumented immigrants than is spent on their care. $16 billion? Yeah. Billion dollars. The Social Security Administration discovered immigrants generated $12 billion in payroll taxes. Thank you. So, do you think people deserve health care? Yeah. Even immigrants? Thank you. Turn this over to Chris Lowe, okay, who's so, going to be talking um, about workers. I think, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit in, in David's the section that, but when we think about workers in this country, there's organized workers and there are unorganized workers, right? The, most of us don't belong to unions. Um, so you may have a, a, and I'm also trying to think about this from the point of view of, have questions that might come from legislators. I mean, I sort of feel like in this session, we're getting into sort of general talking points, and I do want to kind of point us back to what we're trying to do is train ourselves to be the leaders of discussions in our local groups about how we're going to go and lobby. So um, I think that if in your group you have someone who is a labor person who's a trade unionist and wants to be talking to their legislator from that point of view, then um, we want to encourage people to think about what do organized workers get out of single payer and primarily it would be relief from the bargaining pressures that we're talking about. And that, But a key talking point about this is Health benefits, whether you're an organized worker or an unorganized worker, are deferred wages, right? So it's not a gift from the employer that you have health benefits. It's a form of compensation. So a key talking point is this form of, the, the, the pressures of the rising costs of the health system make it so the employers want to shift more of that cost onto workers, and what we want is a system that provides everybody's needs and keeps that cost under control so that workers can get fair compensation, right? So, so that's, that's true across the board. For organized workers, that comes out in the bargaining table. It's more complicated with non-organized workplaces. Um, there's also a piece I want to raise here about when we talk about costs because you're gonna get questions about costs and a lot of times those are sort of individual costs. And what we're aiming for is a system where most people are gonna end up paying less in the taxes that they pay for this whole <coughs> system than they're currently paying for their premiums and their out of pockets over a period of time. Um, but the other kind of costs that we talk about and that we're often gonna see talked about with legislators is costs to fiscal budgets and costs to um, you know, so society as a whole. And those costs are, we, we all pay them already, but they're not paid fairly, right? So, and, 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 and we're not keeping them under control. And so, so the kind of system that we're talking about would help them be able to, to predict you know, how the cost is, is going to be 
uh, and, and see where it's coming from as well. One of the things that happens in the current system is there's no transparency about the actual cost of the care versus costs that are being added into the, the bills that we receive. The bills that we receive don't reflect costs. So a, a talking point that um, the, the actual cost of care, that the talking point you can make to a legislator is that the, you know, the cost of a procedure, a given procedure charged by different providers, you know, in Portland or in Bend or, you know, the same procedure, wildly different costs, and it's because they don't actually request the, reflect the cost of care. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'll just stop there. I'm sorry. So I, have sorry good, I, have, I have a good example. Uh -huh. uh, insurance companies, <coughs> insurance companies delay prevention because it doesn't pay for them. Right. Prevention, uh, those diseases show up during 65 or older, many of them. You and I, through, our, through your Medicare uh, costs and deductions, are paying for that. And so what the insurance companies have done is just moved it over to the government. That's you. Right. And, and, and in the state and local budgets, that's, that's also the Oregon health plan costs. Uh, and just on that point, when David was telling his story before, he didn't actually tell the piece that I've heard him say, which is... <coughs> the amputations that he's seen that are related to diabetes that could have been controlled mm -hmm. with a very simple, you know, with diet and exercise and, and simple medications and the relative cost of that compared to the actual amputation, the cost to the, the patient, the person of what happens, you know, once you're in, amputated and the, the financial <coughs> cost of caring for somebody who's had an amputation. So, so it's a huge difference that, you know, prevention is how we're going to, you know, bring this down. The the other piece to that is that <clears throat> the other piece to that is that Americans have three times the amputation rate. That is, American diabetics have three times the amputation rate that European diabetics do. Wow. Wow. You know, our questions will now kind of eat into our opportunity to test each other. So. Well, I just wanted to make a, add a couple points. Um, I think that's a really good point you were making about um, our healthcare costs right now being deferred wages. And you know, one thing that we should emphasize is that you know we're currently we're forced to pay yearly increases to health insurance companies um, and the health insurance industry um, while wages for workers are stagnant. And while our legislators may not prioritize. Um, single-payer health care, the major focus all the time is the economy. And um, our economy is struggling, and both in terms of um, state and federal budgets, but also in terms of um, creating jobs. And health care costs are a huge barrier for our economy. And as we talk about, both for small businesses and large employers, multinational employers, who have experience, they know what it's like to do business in Germany or France or Canada, as opposed to the United States. And what we're, you know, going back to our main points, that we want a universal, affordable system that produces better results and is truly accessible. This is not some hypothetical experiment we're talking about. This is something that works already in multiple countries all over the world. And this is something that would eliminate the waste. Right now, we have huge amounts of waste um, with our current system. For, you know, just for example, I'm a Portland Public Schools employee. As a full-time employee, my insurance premium was over $18,000 a year, yet I still had to forego some dental care this year because even with that expensive insurance, I had to pay over $1,000 out of pocket for dental work this year, and um, there's a cap. It's not going to cover the rest of the dental work I need, so I'm going to forego that care, even with this expensive um, insurance I have. Okay, thank you very much. Great, great comment. And we're going to go on to the hand, handling difficult questions. I'd like to have one of our leaders pose a difficult question to the group. Well, as, a, a, as an employee for a great company, I have fantastic health insurance, and I don't want to lose that. How is this going to affect me? Oh, well, you'll get yeah. good insurance through the universal thing, and so will everybody else, and that will be a benefit to you. So you're going to win twice. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, but it probably won't be as good as what I have now. <laughs> so it's not right. So there's an interesting thing that happens when people who are healthy and have good insurance pull out of a large pool that covers everybody. It means that they get to go into a system where their care is provided and it leaves the sicker patients behind in the uh, larger public system. That ends up costing more. The result is that when the person with the stroke who has no adequate coverage goes into the hospital and cannot afford all the care, the hospital does not eat the cost of that care. Instead, the hospital passes that cost on to the insurance company, your insurance company. Your insurance company doesn't eat the cost of that care either. They pass it on to you in terms of higher premium costs so that ultimately we all end up paying for the care that everybody gets. And it makes much more sense to do it on a systemized, systematized, organized basis where we in fact can look at how much money is needed to provide care for everybody. If, if the economy goes bad and you get laid off, or if you get sick and you can't work, you're going to lose your insurance. If we have a system that has everybody in, then if you lose your job or you get sick, you still have insurance. And our bill is very strong. It's as strong as the strongest health insurance out there with no deductibles and no co-pays. Um, so it's probably stronger than your insurance. Oh, do we want to move on to other questions, or do you want to explore this more? Yeah, if we have a question. Yeah. But are we focusing on okay, questions that legislators answer. are going to ask? Uh, very quickly, it was pointed out earlier that uh, health insurance from the company is not a gift. It's deferred compensation. Uh, and so what they're not getting in compensation might be going into uh, the insurance company. And again, if you lose that, as, as was pointed out, um, you lose everything. Uh, the more people who are in the pool, better care you get for the least money. I can get a raise. <laughs> do you want to go to a new question, or do you want to explore this further? Maybe the question we want I'd, to I'd like there. to explore uh, Lisa's question. What about questions we're likely to get from legislators? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I've got that one. All right. Um, you, you were... The question that I am, I don't know how to answer is when somebody says, this is a job killer for all of the insurance companies, mm -hmm. the pharma, the lawyers, all of those people that are involved in getting us into this mess. But it is a job killer because a lot of people are gonna go down. Okay, are we ready to go to that question? In Vermont, what's happening is that there's a, as part of your bill, this all has to relate to the bill. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, we're supposed to be talking to legislators, right? So we've got to relate what we're lobbying is to the bill. So everybody, when the bill is written, which we're working on, you know it, backwards and forwards, upside down, inside out. But in Vermont, for example, on this particular question, they have in, embedded in the bill the fact they have, I think it's a five-year or three-year, I think it would be three years, fund that retrains people who lose their job because of the, of the shift in, um, in employment. But the truth is, there aren't that, I mean, there aren't that many at the local level, because national health, is, it's, it's Blue Cross Blue Shield nationally. Yeah, yeah. So the fact that Big Pharma, you know, they're not necessarily here in Oregon, they, maybe some is, but not much. <laughs> but that's how they did, so it's up to us, as we present a bill, as we convince our legislators to pass it, how we deal with these issues. That is going to be in our bill, too. There will be a retraining provision. And it's not just the insurance companies. One of my, one of our activists, Meredith, uh, she got married recently, what's her new name? Anyway, Meredith from ISO is a medical coder in, uh, uh, and she works in the billing for a physician or a small practice. So there are going to be a lot of people, you know, when we talk about the 25% waste in the system, what we're doing is we're paying people to administer insurance rather than deliver care. So from a healthcare point of view, we want to change that, but there are people whose jobs are administering waste, basically. And so, so we want those people to be able to do something more socially useful and productive. And we're going to provide for retraining for them in the bill. So. That's another question. Um, 
One, one thing I would say also is that, sure, we will lose some jobs, but we're going to create many other jobs because there'll be, there are many um, employees right now who are stuck in their jobs that um, they would much rather retire early or start their own business mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs, and they cannot do it because they're um, depending on the health care from their jobs that they're currently employed in. Um, and when we lower the cost of health insurance, it will make it easier for employers, for small businesses, and also for people to um, free their jobs up, who, especially public sector workers like me who are at the top of the salary scale, to open up jobs for younger workers who will be hired at, um, you know, at a lower cost as well. So um, we need to think about the um, jobs that it will create and allow um, our economy to be more innovative. Okay, so this is a question I've been asked by the media and you're going to probably be asked by your legislator, and that is, the ACA is starting to work. We've seen some statistics saying more people in Oregon are covered. Let's let the ACA work. What do you say to that? I am really glad that the ACA has improved lives for a lot of people, and I'm one that benefited from the ACA. I know many people who have benefited from the ACA, and I'm glad that it was passed and it's happened. We need to go to a system where everyone benefits and everyone is covered, the ACA won't get us there. It's still going to leave people uninsured. It's still going to leave people underinsured, so they still run the risk of going bankrupt because of not having enough coverage for treatment when something happens. So it's a step in the right direction, but we still need to go the full... Monty. The, <laughs> we still need to go all the way and get us a system that will work for everyone. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, although the ACA does solve some problems, it leaves many other problems like um, controlling costs mm -hmm. of health insurance and the health care in general, and also in um, terms of not eliminating the waste that we currently have with administrative costs and billing. And most importantly, though, right now, um, if we look at medical bankruptcies, which is the biggest cause of bankruptcy, the majority of people who are going into bankruptcy have health insurance. And we can see what's happening in Massachusetts that have basically implemented an ACA-type reform. They still have not solved these problems. Also, there's a recent study that shows that large corporations, a, a high proportion of them, are cutting back on their insurance benefits. Mm -hmm. They're shifting away from defined benefits to defined contributions. They're raising, they're keeping premiums down by raising deductibles. So we're controlling the cost of insurance and not the cost of medical care mm -hmm. and shifting it on to workers. So the ACA is getting more people into private insurance, but private insurance is still degrading in quality. Building on what Chris says, <clears throat> one thing that's happening too, like Easton points out, is deductibles are going up. <clears throat> Presently in Oregon, the lowest deductible, yeah, the lowest deductible offered by Blue Cross Blue Shield for individual and small business policies is $5,000. <clears> if you are living paycheck to paycheck and you're feeling this little twinge here, you think real hard about making an appointment with your GP because it's going to cost you $200 and a prescription, and you may even have to take some time off from work to go do it. So you put it off. And, and frankly, a lot of things go away. You know, to apply a little time to the, to the disease and it goes away. But by and by, that twinge becomes more and more urgent, and by the time that you finally decide you can't stand it anymore, that stage one tumor has become a stage three tumor. That's one of the things that's wrong with the ACA. Okay. If you need to ask a question of someone who's um, come here as not a leader. So listen, uh, I appreciate your coming to the office to uh, lobby on behalf of your organization. I'm familiar with all of these facts. I've spoken to my colleagues about this. I've spoken to health professionals. And above all, I've spoken to many union leaders. And what I can tell you is, is that they're not behind you. Although they may believe in this, they give it lip service. 
but nobody is coming out and exercising leadership on this. And if I go against this, I'm going to have to have a lot of difficulty raising money because the people who are against it are very powerful and very wealthy. And there's just, there's just no percentage in it. Ooh, this is actually a good opportunity to talk about the most famous person in Canada. <laughs> and, but we can also mention that, for example, there are a lot of unions that are getting behind this and supporting this. And when, what they see when they look at legislators, if they want to decide to give you some support, they're looking at the whole package of what you're working on. Are there things that you're doing that are, that are working for working people? And so this isn't going to be a litmus test for all of the unions, but this is something that will bring people out as activists in support of you, in support of your campaign. When people see that you're going to really take leadership, and work on this, they're going to be more inspired to come out and help you. And my answer to that is, if you look at the statistics of the people who are benefiting, those are the people who are, who are on Oregon health plans. They're the ones who the expansion has benefited the most. They don't vote. Public um, employees. To go back to the first point, um, I would say that um, HCO has 97 organizations that's part of our coalition, the majority of whom are unions. And sure, some of these unions um, may not have been actively pushing for um, single payer yet, but unions are in this transition. Um, unions, more than any other group, are fighting to um, counter the inequality that we're suffering from, that workers have been suffering from stagnant wages. We're tired, workers are tired of automatically giving raises to the health insurance industry year after year, double digit raises while their wages are stagnant. And it's time that workers are, rank and file workers are making demands that union leadership change and that we do something to counter this inequality. And one major way of doing that is to recapture the wages that are lost that go to health insurance costs and also to gain more bargaining power for workers. And especially as unions and public sector unions are um, fighting to prove that we are um, working for the benefits of the broader interests beyond just our own members, they are looking for these broader kinds of um, issues that are going to fight for the benefits of the middle class Americans. And um, unions are transforming right now. Let me, let me add one more, one more thing. I hear what you're saying. It's, it's very impressive. You, you've tallied up in a, a number of different organizations. But as you pointed out, they're not active. And what you're suggesting is that the government take over responsibility for delivering health care. And all they have to do is to point out cover Oregon. Thank you. Uh, Representative Marquez, this is one thing I want to mention to you. <laughs> that sounds good. Several years ago when we spoke about uh, med legalizing medical marijuana, he didn't want to get behind it because there were so many organizations, the law enforcement that weren't behind it, and the groups that did support it were all just pot smokers out in the streets. They didn't do anything anyway. Well, it turned out it was actually a very popular, broad-based movement, and when it got on the ballot, it passed by a strong vote. It was put on the ballot again, it passed. Uh, so the vote showed that broad support was there. What we want to do is we want to encourage you to get out in front of these issues before it's proven that the broad support is there, but to show that this is something that there is broad support. We need to have leadership on it to make sure that people see that it's there. And instead of being the one that, after the vote has been done, says, yeah, I'm on board the, for this now, get on board before the vote is done so that people see how much support there is. Take some leadership. Senator Marquez, uh, we are, uh, we are we grateful. <laughs> Governor Marquez. <laughs> right. Well, uh, to follow up on what uh, my, my cohorts have said, the fact is the national NEA, not the local chapter, but the national leadership, has taken leadership on this issue in the state of Vermont, which is uh, the first state in the country to actually be moving this forward on a state level 
working hard, but they have funded over $200,000 into the effort of having a single-payer system created for the state of Vermont because they see the writing on the wall and because they care about all the middle class, all of the uh, Americans being covered. So they are there leading. You could be one of those leaders, too. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you then, sir, when I report to the media your stand on the issue of universal health care, it would be accurate to say that the financial <laughs> interests of the company of the country are backing it, then you would, uh, you would vote in favor of the benefits for their constituency. Well, certainly, it, not if it's going to be run by a government program, no. I'm sorry? Not if it's going to be run by some government program. Oh, but I, that would be what I would report to the media then, that, uh, that you would be disinterested until the financial... You would report that I don't support government programs leading medical. I see that for the post office. Medicare? <laughs> yes, we should. We can Indian start. Yes. I'm now channeling the Tea Party candidate from the yes. Eastern Oregon. <laughs> now, isn't it a fact that government-run health care is failing? That Medicare makes doctors go crazy and opt out of even covering Medicare patients? That the VA administration is failing? That the spectacular failure of Cover Oregon points out that government can't run health care? The interesting thing about governmental programs is they're required by public law and public disclosure to let you know when problems occur. None of the private companies or industries are required to do that because that's proprietary information. And there's very good evidence if you interview people who are involved, for example, in computer systems installations, that they have just as much problem doing it for private companies as they did for Cover Oregon, and there is no difference. The myth that somehow private industry is more successful or more efficient than governmental agencies is just that. It's a myth. It does not exist. Actually, the problems with Cover Oregon came from the private sector. It was because of the complexity of the private insurance and the need to have all these different kinds of plans that the, it, you know, the, the computer programmers couldn't handle it. The, the public sector, the, the greatest number of people who've gotten new coverage in this whole process have come through the public program, the Oregon Health Plan, and it's been very efficient in signing people up for the Oregon Health Plan on the whole. So it's, you know, it's... Sir, if you do not believe in uh, government programs, why are you in the legislature? <laughs> Why are you running for the legislature? <laughs> so, you, so you really, in a sense, are against government. Yes, and all my constituents support And you're you're against our military. Oh no, that's that's not going to be. You're against education. You're against our education. Absolutely. <laughs> Air traffic control. Are you, are you against roads? Roads, bridges, libraries, stop signs. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I don't understand. I live in the national forest. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, my cattle graze on public land. <laughs> so uh, there are my name is government yeah. government programs in. Almost every, well, in every other industrialized nation in the world, have been very successful at running healthcare programs. Uh, I, it, are we to suppose that in this country, government is not capable of doing what it is capable of doing in every other country? And if so, is it because we have leaders like you? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I think we have to. Um, clarify that what we have currently with our private system is not any market system. There's no transparency. There's no way that people can shop comparing costs. We have basically a private dictatorship over which people have no control. Second of all, um, we should remember that Medicare and Social Security are both two not perfect programs, and, and the VA, not perfect programs, but programs that are by far popular with the people that have 
um, long-lasting history that um, show that they are effective. And we should remember that Medicare was actually a major service to the insurance industry by taking off the eldest, the sickest patients off the rolls. And if the government could provide not delivery, we're talking about health insurance, um, at a lower cost with less waste, um, if you look at their administrative costs, we know that Medicare is a successful system, and even the VA fully socialized system um, is, again, treating some of the most um, you know, post-traumatic stress, um, suffering, and um, medical um, issue, people with medical issues, and granted that any system, if you starve it and you don't um, provide enough funding for it, it's not going to be successful, but we know that they, the VA gets lower medical, lower drug prices than any other thing, um, system that we have um, in the United States. And um, so we can build on these things that we know that work with the government systems for whether it's um, VA or um, Medicare and make them even better with our single payer bill. I'd like to respond to you as a conservative, ec economic conservative, you would be in favor of any kind of program that was going to save the people money, wouldn't you? Right, on new taxes. Well, this program that we're advocating is going to result in massive savings that are going to return to your constituents. And you're not going to have to worry about the government running the program. The government is not going to run any of these medical programs. Programs. What we're asking for is a change in the way the system is financed. Now, I know you're concerned about rising health costs. Haven't your premiums gone up? Haven't your constituents complained about budget cuts because of increases in local costs that are mainly due to costs of health care? Well, I can guarantee you that we will reduce those amounts. And these savings are going to come through efficiencies. And it's not going to be the government that is delivering health care. We're going to save money, and the money that's saved is going to go back to those individual proprietary organizations who currently deliver health care. And we're going to be able to increase the number of people who provide health care and cover more people. So it's a win-win for everybody. I'd like to just make two comments. One is um, whenever we're talking to any uh, representative, the senator, the governor, be respectful. It's very yeah. important. You know, that's something that, you know, I know that there was some, some stuff said that was, you know, tongue in cheek. But um, in, in this group, that's okay. But we want to make sure that when we're actually talking to them, we're, we're handling it um, respectfully. I think both of these guys did a really good job doing exactly that. Um, the other thing is, you know, let's use our stories. I mean, we have stories. We know people that have stories. Let's find the people in their districts that have the stories. I think one of the main stories we need to highlight nowadays is that now that uh, the Affordable Care Act has rolled out is, is the story of underinsurance. Um, it's, I think, the primary story at this point. So. I'm talking to small business people. One of the first things I tell them is, your taxes are going to go up. I let it settle in for a moment. And you, you can see the resistance. And then I say, but you will no longer pay premiums, co-pays, or deductibles. And then I stop. And you can see the gears whirring, and they never ask me again about costs. So one thing I wanted to just, um, Senator Warnkes, and where he went, one thing I just wanted to include in there was mentioning that because one of one things that conservatives are really afraid of is taking away our choice of doctors. So one thing I would also add is that you still will have your choice of doctor. The government's not going to tell you where to go. 
And yeah, by the way, and by the, the way, company. in the private insurance company, you don't really have a choice of doctors if they're not in your network. Yes. Too bad. Too bad. That's exactly what I was going to say. I was going to say, you know, do you believe that um, people deserve a choice? My health insurance costs eighteen thousand dollars a year, and my choice is limited. I can't see anyone that uh, is closest to me geographically when I'm having a medical emergency. I have to worry about who's going to be covered. So, so I have a different question. Um, when I talk to my constituents, and I agree with this point, they say to me they think health care should be a personal responsibility. So wh why should I be supporting a program which is going to take away personal responsibility and say that a government program is going to be responsible for people's health care even if they're not responsible about their own health? I wanted to go back to the first one just a second. I, in the underinsured, the people who are underinsured are the least available ability to pay the uh, any of the costs. I talked to a person who had problems, and she's minimum wage at best, works a couple of jobs, so she bought a high deductible. That's all she could afford, but she, if she has a problem, she's done because she's got a three to five thousand dollar deductible and she can't pay that on a ten thousand dollar salary did, did anyone answer chris's question yeah. jill's going there well, lisa, lisa will and then i will okay so the first thing i would say was is that in countries that do have a single payer universal health care system they catch things before they become big things because you have more access so prevention which includes some education about how to take care of yourself, how to take personal responsibility, is much more involved in a single-payer system than it is in our system now, and people will learn those things through, um, through our system. For example, in Japan, they, the schools teach the kids how to brush their teeth. They also do uh, weights of kids who are overweight. And so they do the check the weight on them with the idea of helping them become more responsible. Okay. Senator Lowe, in regards to your, your statement, I, I agree <laughs> in individual responsibility in most circumstances. And one of the things that I do as a small business owner is I want to be able to hire people and ensure that they have all the benefits that they need. Now, as a small business owner, one of the things I've run into is there have been times when I wanted to hire people to help with a particular project. It's a temporary position. I just want to bring them on to be able to do this job so I can get this project and get this job done. And I'm not going to be able to, I don't have anything guaranteed to be able to keep them employed for months on end. I can't even guarantee that I can keep them employed for a full month. So what I run into is if I want them to have health insurance, I have to be able to pay for a full premium for something that is going to cost a lot more than the payroll would itself to pay them to come in and work temporarily. They're trying to put together jobs. They're working several different part-time jobs. They're working at different places, getting temporary jobs here and there. They aren't, from those jobs, able to get health insurance coverage. If, as a small business, I could tell them, on your paycheck, I add in, I pay a certain percentage that then ensures that you have health insurance, and I don't have to pay $500 a month up front, I can pay a, you know, 11% onto their payroll, whatever that is, then I could hire them to come in and work for me on these projects, and I don't have to worry about them not having health insurance, and I don't have to worry about coming up with this monthly premium just to have them work one week. So it would give you more flexibility. Right. Ah. Um, one other point about personal responsibility. Again, under the current system that we have, which is not a market system, there's no ability to, for people to be personally responsible because what happens is um, people go to the hospital, 
their private insurance covers whatever at whatever cost without people knowing exactly what different procedures will cost compared to um, at one location or another location. And that all that cost gets passed on to all the rate payers, and this is what drives up our health insurance premiums. What, what well, uh, characterizes someone who has personal responsibility in terms of health will go to the doctor preventatively. That is really personal responsibility, but we can't afford it. I'd like to give you an example about personal responsibility that has to do with the issue of homelessness. Now, I don't think we agree about, uh, we disagree about the issue of personal responsibility. But we do also agree about the fact that there's some people who are not capable of exercising that responsibility because of their age, because of conditions that they have. And sometimes those conditions can result in people entering dire straits. And we know in the homeless population that the majority of them are people who are ridden with the problems of mental health and drug addiction. A conservative state such as Utah has determined that rather than exercise programs that encourage people to take responsibility, that their housing be taken care of first. We don't ask them to go into a program to, to learn how to control their, their disorder when they don't have a home. Because we know in order to achieve those kinds of changes, you need to have stability. And if the, the data show that when you go into a home, you're able to access care, and the cost to the state of taking care of those homeless people will go 